And so once I figured out, like, hey, this ain't just this ain't just for showing people what I'm doing. Like, I can make some money off of this yeah. deal as well. And then I really started kind of leaning into it because I knew in back in my mind that sooner or later I'm going to be on my own. And it made me a better cowboy as well because mm-hmm. I could go longer, I could go harder, I could ride more broncs than anybody else, you know. It didn't matter. I'm going to get on five a day if that's what y'all want to do. Mm-hmm. I would go out and have a big night drinking or doing or running or weekend or whatever it may be. And then I would come home and to punish myself, I guess, for doing what I knew I shouldn't have been doing. I would work my ass off. Like, I got work anyway. It didn't matter. Like, mm-hmm. I could have an hour's worth of sleep, and we could work for 15, 18 hours. And like, he could be a 100, or he could be what I punished myself that way. That's kind of my punishment, because I mm-hmm. knew I wasn't supposed to be doing what I was doing. So we're here at the Wealthy Cowboy Show, number one with the ledge. Number one. <laughs> Buster Frierson, you feel honored to be here, be number one. I do, I really do, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe it'll turn into something, or maybe, maybe we're the only ones listening to it. I don't well, know. It might be. It, it'll turn into something. That, that, I know you. I know you well enough. You'll make it something. Yeah. So yeah, we'll we'll see. We'll see where we're at in a year. Or so right on. <laughs> so uh, oh, you've gone through a lot in the past couple years left your full-time ranch job went out on your own got married (laughs) uh some cool things how's how's life been man life's been good it's been it's been a blur the last few years you're exactly right i uh i ran a ranch for about 15 16 years and quit there they of course it's right over here in the edge of town and Mm -hmm. they sold it off and subdividing it right now and i decided that you know i'd been there 15, 16 years, and I knew it was coming sooner or later just because it was too close to town and, it, you know, the real estate market's out of, yeah. out of this world good right around there. So I'd kind of been planning and preparing for that day, and when it happened, I, I went out on my own and had a few cows and had some lease places and, you know, had a couple of horses that was riding and trading and training and just kind of went out and thought, you know what, if I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it on yeah. my own or I'm going to fail on my own, you know, not – leaning on anybody or taking anybody's money every month from a, just a salary. So yeah, that's kind of, it has, it's been a crazy, it's been a crazy last seven or eight years, really, to be honest with you, just everything that's went on and where I'm at. And Well, you were lucky to kind of have something built up and have a brand built up before, before it all happened. And you had something to fall back on. It seems like. Yes, sir. A yeah. lot, a lot of guys in our business, in the ranching business, they just, they get fired or something happens and lose their job, their ranch job, and, you know, they're borrowing a tr- pickup and trailer to try to find and go move to another ranch job and move into that house. So. Yes, there's no doubt, you know, and I was one of those guys, you know, for a long time, and, like, my pickup broke down. That's all I had, you know, and mm-hmm. that was it. And, and you know, just as well as I do, that's just part of that lifestyle because you don't make a lot of money punching cows for a living or, you know, cowboying, whatever you want to say. Most of the time you just – you're just kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel, making ends meet, and mm-hmm. trying to do whatever you can do to keep the bills paid and the lights on and the heater running, you know, or the air conditioning in summertime. So it's one of those deals that I did I did kind of see it coming and uh, was like, you know what, one of these days I want to be sustained by my own self besides somebody else. I, I realized that working for somebody is cool to work for somebody, no doubt, on mm-hmm. a big ranch or a little ranch or – you know, day working around, you can kind of get around and make a little money here and there. But when it dries up, it dries up. When the summertime hits and it's 100, 110 degrees, everybody quits working, you know, for three or four months, really. And it's one of those deals like, what do you do now? And uh, I'd seen that and been there and been that guy, you know. And so this second time around, I was like, you know what, once this this full-time gig's up, I'm going to go out on my own and I'm going to try to make it. And so I started preparing five or six years before that, to be real honest with you, and got lucky. And that's what's funny is a studio we're in right now, I I got some lease country just right down the road. And uh, this was kind of my first piece of country that I did get to lease. Was I mean, literally, I mean, it's five miles just west of us where we're at. Mm -hmm. And uh, I picked up a few other little pieces around there, you know, and like I say, when I say little, I mean little 100-acre place is what I started with. And then I picked up another two or 300 acres and I picked up another three or 400 acres. And before long, 
I looked up, and I had almost 2,000 acres leased just right here west of town. And uh, and it's a grind. You just got to take what – when you're getting started, take what nobody else wants. Exactly. And then you know, hope, I fixed hope that you, <laughs> you fall into something better. No doubt. I fixed a lot of fence right over here, you know, and put waters in and clean tanks out. Just It was just old – stuff that been sitting around for nothing and some real estate people bought it for an investment and mm-hmm. uh, i was in with them when i had that other little place because they need a tax write-off and so that helped with me you know i mean like i had a few cows and when they'd call me on another piece i'd go borrow some money and from the bank and buy a few more cows and when i ended up i guess having i don't know 100 150 cows turned out over here you know around around and in and out and for a single man at that time, I was like, "Shoot, I can, I can make this work," you know, mm-hmm. and uh, just rocked along there until I got those cows paid off, and then you know, and and I didn't take a dime for four years. I just worked for nothing yeah. for myself. I, luckily, I had a salary, you know, coming from mm-hmm. that other deal, and so it was kind of a blessing, I guess, in disguise. But yeah, it, it was a, it was a grind there for about that third year. I'm like, why am I doing this? You yeah. know. I mean, like, I'd do my full-time job, and then after my full-time gig, I'd come over in the afternoons or, you know, on the weekends and tend to my personal stuff. And it was there for about three years. I was grinding my ass off and like, man, this ain't even worth it. I ain't yeah. even made a dime. All I'm doing yeah. is just spending my money. But once I got the cows paid off and kind of got a that A few deal, years, you look up and you got something. Right. And so, you know, and then you, like, pat yourself on the back, like, man, I'm glad I did that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've done that several. Like, I've got a place leased right now, and some cows turned out, and it's uh, this is my second year, and I mean, it's it's not really profitable. Like, I haven't seen anything right. from it yet. Just putting in a lot of work, and uh, uh, and you know, but I I know that eventually down the road, you know, it'll it'll catch up. Yeah. You know, you got to take all those hard deals and on the front end, and then on the back end, you know, it's a little more passive, a little little yes, more sir. upside to it. For sure. Uh, let, for a little bit of context, let's just go back. Um, don't get too deep, but like growing up, you grew up in West Texas. Um, I go through that. There's some you've had some pivotal moments in your life that <laughs> yeah. uh, I kind of want to unravel and ask you about. And, okay, and uh, but just kind of go through that, and then we'll just we'll we'll un- unravel All those. Right. So, not to get real deep in the background on where I grew up. I grew up between Roby and Rotan. Uh, which is northwest of Abilene, if you're not familiar with that, about 65, 70 miles. It's literally like the city limit sign was 416, population 416 in mm-hmm. Roby. We lived on a dirt road, and we were poor as all get out. You know, I mean, we lived in a small little wooden house uh, down a dirt road, had a, my dad cowboyed and farmed and ranched and welded and worked in the oil field. My mom worked for the Postal Service. 35 miles kind of uh, be northeast of where we lived. And so she'd get up in the mornings at three and drive to work to carry the mail. And, uh, you know, in that at 35 miles from where we were at, my dad, like I said, my dad was jack of all trades, did everything that he could do to provide for his family, which is what a lot of people did back in the late 70s, mm-hmm. early 80s. You know, the oil field would hit and then it would go away and yeah. then they'd come back. And so, he was just one of those guys that he started a lot of cults for the public and he day worked and he welded and uh, and it's funny that it comes back around that's kind of what I'm doing now you know I mm-hmm. do anything and everything to make a dollar and uh, I would say my dad was very diversified so grew up there and uh, my dad actually took a job at National Rail Car at that time in Roscoe which is about 25 miles be southwest of where we grew up and so he was driving back and forth for a long time, just going to work and running. He ran the uh, – he was a purchasing agent when he took the job over there. And then he ended up being the manager of the whole plant when it was all said and done. But we moved to Roscoe when I – at the end of my eighth grade year. I graduated high school <coughs> – excuse me, from Roscoe. And then I went to college at Tarleton State for about a semester. <laughs> and uh, – you were almost a statistic, right? Yeah, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> you just you go to go to college and party and and drop out after after a year, semester, yeah. or two semesters, or whatever, and then go be a cowboy. <laughs> yeah. So I went to college and uh, and during high school, I always loved to hunt and fish and be in the outdoors, you know. And I grew up around horses and helping my dad start colts. My granddad had cows, you know. We didn't. I didn't grow up on a ranch. 
And uh, but I grew up around horses and cows, and my dad rodeoed and did all that. So we grew up doing all that, you know. I mean, like mm-hmm. riding and roping and going to AJ rodeos, and I mean that was that was our hobbies. And so was, I grew that, up, was AJ finals in Sweetwater then? Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. Right down yeah. the road. Yeah, right then. down the road. So I mean, it was easy and. Yeah, all those little AJs around, Snyder, Gale, Sweetwater, Roby, you know, everybody had an AJRA rodeo mm-hmm. around at that time. And so grew up kind of doing that. And my dad was, my dad rode kids. He rode bareback horses. He was on both ends of the arena, just like all those guys back mm-hmm. in the days. You know, the majority of them did because the rodeos didn't pay me nothing like they do now. So you had to go in two just or did three everything. events. Yeah, they did everything, you know. And so. That's kind of how I grew up. I learned to rope when I was a little bitty. I mean, they got pictures of me roping cats, and they got pictures like in diapers, you know what I mean? So I always handled the rope really well. My dad would was adamant about that, like, hey, when you get home from school, I want you to rope the dummy 100 times. And yeah. I think I've told this story probably on a couple other podcasts, <laughs> but 100 times. And if you missed it, 98, you started over at 100 times, you know, mm-hmm. at zero. And so every afternoon I'd come home and I'd rope the dummy and I'd handle the rope and I'd ride horses and I'd exercise colts for my dad that he thought I could ride, you know. So I was always around it, but I wasn't necessarily a ranch kid, you mm-hmm. know, but just a country kid more or less. Yeah. So I'd got to, in high school, I got to helping a cousin of mine go and he guided deer hunts all over Texas. And so... I got to going down there and skinning deer and helping the cook and doing that on the weekends. That deal can pay pretty good. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, it was a lot a, of rich people. They like to go hunting. <laughs> it was a good deal. It was a good deal, especially for me, you know, and enjoyed the outdoors and enjoyed mm-hmm. hunting and got to be around those guys that did it for a living and got to be around guys that paid for it to go do mm-hmm. it, you know. And so that was cool getting to be around that. And then, like I say, went to school at Tarleton for a semester and the guy that ran the outfit and agency called me that fall and he says hey you want to go to new mexico with me and guide for me and i was like mm, yeah <laughs> so i loaded up my stuff and got in with him he lived in winters texas at that time and i got i drove down to winters and i loaded all my hunting gear with him and we went to new mexico in august september end of august first september i guess and i stayed all winter and just guided hunts with him and kind of was like this is what i'm going to do I came back, and, of course, we got done with hunting around January and we didn't really know what that I was going to do, but I thought, man, if I can. So I asked him, I said, hey, you reckon you need somebody full-time? And he was like, yeah, you know what? I think it would be good. Cause I, so I started working full-time for him, just guiding hunts, and we had hunt from August till about May, really. I mean, mm-hmm. dude, we, he, had, he got some bird dogs, and we started doing quail hunts, and then we started doing spring turkey hunts. So we'd hunt all the way to the end of May. The majority of the time, we'd have a couple months off, and then June, July, he would send me to go scout ranches just to see if we'd, you know, he'd have one that he wanted to lease, and I'd go scout them, whether I did it pickup or whether I did it, you know, horseback or whether I did it out of helicopter. Yeah. But I would go do that for him through in the summer months, and then once August rolled around, we'd pack all our gear and we'd go back to hunting. And I did that for about four or five years with him, <coughs> and uh, one night we come home from New Mexico and. He had some kids, and they were getting old enough up into school that he was missing out on all their mm-hmm. sports and activities. And he told me, he said, I'm done. I'm retiring. He'd been doing it for 20-something-plus years. And he said, if you want this gig, he said, I'll book the hunts, and you run them. And at that time, I was 21, 22, you know, and uh, thought I knew a lot. But <laughs> I knew I knew at that time that I wasn't responsible enough to take that gig. Yeah, It would have been a great gig, but I'd have messed it up at that time. And I knew that. And I just told him I wasn't ready. I said, I'm not. And then he said, okay. You know, he said, I I understand. And so one of the guys that worked with us in Texas a lot, I was been, I grew up kind of with him as well. And he worked for Lone Star Gas. I, uh, he got me a job on a construction crew and I went to work for Lone Star Gas in Abilene after that and worked for them about a year and a half, I guess. And ran into a girl that at the rodeo at Abilene at the PRCA rodeo and, she was from Fort Worth, and I got to dating her and driving back and forth working for Lone Star Gas. And about that time, TU bought Lone Star Gas. And I was driving up here Friday when I'd get off work. I'd My pickup stayed hot, you know, and I'd drive to Fort Worth and hang out on the weekends, get up Monday morning about 3 o'clock in the morning and drive home and go back to work. And that's mm-hmm. kind of what my schedule was. And so I've I got, done that before. <laughs> so I kind of got to 
doing that. And I was like, man, this is, I need to find something else. Well, TU Electric had bought Lone Star Gas about that same time. And so I was seeing job postings in Fort Worth on the computer. So I applied for a lineman job in Fort Worth and came up here and interviewed for it and got it. Moved to Fort Worth. And, of course, that was the first time, you know, I mean, I hadn't really been around a big town, big city, or lived in one, you know. Yeah. So I moved to Fort Worth and went to work climbing poles for TU Electric. And I climbed poles for TU for about five years, six years. And just I liked the camaraderie. I liked the brotherhood. I liked the guys. I liked the work. I just didn't like living in town. I yeah. really didn't. I mean, Fort Worth was too big for me at that time. I got, Were you just like in an apartment? or No, I actually lived in a barn dominium. And uh, I'd rented and uh, lived in a barn dominium. Had, I mean, I had a horse or two, you know, yeah. and just kind of did that deal. But it was one of them. I just did not like living in town. Yeah. And uh, so, it's fun for a couple of days. Yeah, or it's something, fun for but... a couple of days. I got in quite a bit of trouble, actually. <laughs> I mean, I, that was one reason I needed to get out of town. <laughs> but uh, when, when did, so like when, uh, when did the biker thing like? When did you get on a motorcycle and start yeah. working out and all that? Was that was so, that at that time or was that? No, like, no, 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 no. I I'd quit. I guess I quit TU Electric and uh, I'd made enough friends around kind of Weatherford Tin Top area that I hung out with some guys around some ranches and different things, you know, around there. And I just wanted to get back to that lifestyle, and so I took it. I quit TU and I took a job. And it was kind of a perfect gig for me because a ranch out there at Tin Top had a high fence place and quite a bit of country, mm -hmm. and they needed a guy that could kind of do everything. And I, like I say, I grew up welding and building fence and whatever with my dad, so I already had that background, you know. And then I had the guiding background. Well, they had a high fence place along with they wanted to start a hunting operation. And so I hired on with those guys and started a hunting outfit operation for them. And then on my downtime, I would just help around the ranch, cowboy and build fence, build arena, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and whatever needed done. And so I'd hunt for half the year and then I'd take, you know, and so that deal kind of took off and got to going and being really good. And I got to riding a few outside horses and starting colts again and doing that deal. And I, uh, I did that for, I don't know, five or six years working for them and kind of got into the again what you want to get into the weeds with me i kind of got into too much drinking and running and carousing and got in some trouble and had to kind of go through that stint in my yeah. life you know and got through that and uh after all that that's kind of when i went to i had to replace my drinking and running with something and so that's when i got into working out like i was going to ranch rodeos every weekend somewhere they'd kind of blown up you know and there was a ranch rodeo to go to well i I rode the Bronx and I mugged the cows and I, you know, all that. And so mm -hmm. every weekend, I on Mondays I'd be so sore yeah, I couldn't hardly go walk. Go and get your ass kicked every yeah, weekend. Exactly. I mean, just get my ass handed to me, you know. And I'd be so sore. And I was drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and doing all that, and you know, being the cowboy. Yeah. And uh, get. I finally just one day decided I'm like I'm sick of being sore and hurting and mm -hmm. being out of shape, and uh, so I. Threw the beer down, threw the cigarettes down, and decided I was going to replace it with something else, and that's kind of where the working out came from, and that's where I kind of still had to have that adrenaline junk feel, yeah. you know, and so I got into riding motorcycles, and why? I don't know, because I thought they were cool, I guess. <laughs> they and, are cool. <laughs> you know, so I got me my first motorcycle, and I was, I was a 99 Fat Boy. Then I rode it for a couple of years and got to figuring it out how to ride one. I still don't ride that good, but I can <laughs> ride pretty well. But And then I traded it in for another one, and I rode it for a couple of years, and I traded it in for another one, and then I wrecked it, and uh, I don't have one anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, rem it, I remember you saying that getting hit by a grasshopper going down the road on a motorcycle is like getting punched in the face. Yeah, it's no doubt. It's no <laughs> joke. And, of course, I'd be cowboy cool. I wore, you know, I didn't wear a helmet, just a jacket or a vest and T-shirt and ball cap turned around backwards in some shades. And so that was that was kind of one of my little, I don't know if you'd call it a midlife crisis because I wasn't quite <laughs> midlife yet. But Well, I think it's like a, I, I was that same way, like when you want to, you know, quit a habit, replace it with something. So, like, I did the same thing. I quit drinking as much like when I would come home in the evenings. Or uh, a lot of times I like to work out in the mornings and just like just replace replace something with going to the gym. Say I'm going to quit doing this as much. I'm going to quit watching TV as much, and I'm going to go to the gym. And pretty much you don't want to do that other habit. 
Yeah, so you exactly. know, you, you get hooked on going to the gym or roping or whatever that new one is, and you forget about the old one. Yes, sir, for sure. Yeah, you, you, you got to, I mean, we as animals, I mean, you get into a habit and you got to replace that habit or otherwise you just lay around in the shade and not do nothing, mm-hmm. you know, and kind of just get fat and wither away or whatever you want to say. But it's kind of one of those deals where you got to figure out something to do to because we're wired different than a lot of people. I mean, like, if you're a cowboy, you're wired different than most folks. There's mm-hmm. just something about it, you know. I mean, we take a lot of chances. We like that adrenaline. There's things that we do that other people are like, there ain't no way I'll yeah. do that, you know. Pretty hard-headed, and, I would say, right, most very of hard-headed, <laughs> you know. And, like, it's one of those deals where – you crack your you you crack out after a cow out in the pasture and you know just as well as I do. I mean you you hook that thing around the saddle horn and pull your hat down and what do they say? You go until the job's done. I yeah. mean that's what it is. And like you know, I mean there's lots of wrecks and lots of bad injuries and lots of things come from it. But there's also that feeling like hey, there's only a few of us and I call it the one percenters. You know, Not, yeah. and it kind of got that from the motorcycle deal as well. Like there's a lot of guys out there and I was one of them that just rode a motorcycle. But there's one percenters that are they're a different breed, you know. Mm-hmm. They do things differently. Now, I'm not saying yeah. that all that they do is good, because it's not. But they're the one percenters. There's mm-hmm. lots of guys that ride motorcycles on Saturday and Sunday, but there ain't many guys that ride the, them on yeah, Sunday. Yeah, the weekend warriors, yeah. just like the weekend warrior exactly, cowboys and know, everything. Tuesday when it's 20 degrees outside and it's sleeting, those guys that are riding their bike, I call them the one percenters. They're, mm-hmm. the, they're the guys that, that that's what they live and breathe by and die by. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as a cowboy, there's there's also one percenter cowboys. There ain't no doubt in my mind. And I say it a lot nowadays because there's a lot. The cowboy Western influence has taken off all of a sudden in the last few years. And we can all attribute that to a certain things or a certain ideals or shows or whatever you want to say i mean we can get into that too but there's guys that put on hats and go to the fort worth stock show and rodeo and that's the only time they do it you and i ain't one of them and there's a lot of guys that aren't that Mm -hmm. one percenters that you get up on days that it's nine degrees outside and the wind's blowing 25 miles an hour right straight out of the north and you get horseback and go check heifers. I mean, that's a different breed. That's a different mentality Mm -hmm. that most people don't have that wherewithal and that Grit, grit, I guess, grind, that hard-headedness maybe that, hey, this is what we're going to do and this is what I want to do and this is how I'm going to do it, you know. Mm. And so that's a cool feeling, you know, being a part of something that's slim to none, you know. I mean, there's – and there are one percenters everywhere in whatever field you want to get in, you know. I mean, there's there's one percent in the NFL. They're the top football players in the world, you know. I mean, there's one – same, we can go through every – aspect of life there's one percenters in everything well i think it's easy nowadays to stand out because everybody it seems like there's so many soft people if you just try a little bit if you show up on time if you put forth a little effort if you go to the gym i mean there's like some kind of crazy statistic like over 30 um like most people like something like 90 percent or some kind of crazy number never sprint you know, right. or 25 or 30, whatever it is, you know. So if you just, if you're 35 years old and you just run 100 yards, you're in a very small percentage. No I mean, it's easy to stand out nowadays when, when everybody's so soft. No doubt. I totally agree. I saw a deal the other day and a guy's like 48 or 49 years old and he's running 40 yard sprints. And he said, everybody thinks you lose your athletic ability when you get out of your 20s. He said, you just quit using your athletic mm-hmm. ability. And so it goes away. It's just like anything. If you don't pick up a rope for six years, you're going to be rusty when you pick it up. I don't care how good you were when you were doing it. Mm-hmm. If you don't do something for a period of time, you lose that skill. Mm-hmm. It's just part of life. I mean, hell, anybody, nobody writes cursive anymore. Everybody prints or types or text or that thing right there. Mm-hmm. And, like, I tried to write something in cursive the other day, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. You know what I mean? <laughs> I couldn't do it. Yeah. yeah. It took a lot of concentration and a lot of effort to do it. And it was like, wow, it's crazy. But, I mean, life's like that. If you quit doing it, you're going to get out of – you're going to get rusty. You're going to get war. You know, it's, you got to get back into that skill. And so it's like – just like you say, anything, you know, I mean, running sprints. Mm-hmm. You're you're pretty much an elite somebody. It, just going to the gym five yeah. days a week or four days a week, I mean, you're in a percentile that's slim to none. Yeah. And you see it. All the time and hear people like, uh, I mean, I'm 32 now and it's like people when they're 30, it's like they start dying. They're like, oh, I'm getting older. You know, I can't do that anymore. You know, I can't, 
I can't lift heavy stuff. You know, I can't do this or that. You know, I'm getting old. And, right. And you're what, 40? 40, 48. I'll be 49 in April. And, and you rode, just rode some Bronx, right? <laughs> yeah. Like I got on, I got on a couple of Bronx like a couple of years ago. I mm-hmm. mean, like, well, yeah, Weatherford at the Ranch Rodeo. I mean, I rode, I rode the last Bronx at the WRCA finals and I was 46. Yeah. That was the last time I got on a Bronx at the World Finals. And you see most guys when they, when they turn 40, they're not, you go work cash and they're not flanking calves they're not right. roping stuff they're not they want to you know sit back yeah and uh but but then you lose it you know yeah for sure but if you see like boots or, or tom morehouse you, you know they're 80 something nine yeah, i don't boots know 90 yeah and, yeah and still still do it he's still wearing out saddles i yeah. see cow, just got him a new one yeah the i saw day, cow huh? puncher got him a new one i mean he's that? still wearing them out that's pretty cool and you know it's like last summer i think boots got bucked off and broke his leg last mm. sp- spring you know i mean for a 90-year-old man to get on a horse that might buck him off is something else. <laughs> but for him to buck him off and him be out in the pasture in the middle of nowhere and get bucked off and break his femur, not his, like his shin bone, Ooh. like he broke his femur, and then come back from it, you know. Yeah. And his back, horseback, just the other day, we saw, you know, I mean, he's horseback already back mm-hmm. again, which is crazy to me. It's hard for somebody young to come back from that. Yeah, exactly. You know I mean? It's one of those deals where if you don't, you don't. I mean, if you're not doing it, you're losing it, whatever mm-hmm. it may be. I don't care what it is. I mean, yeah. you lose it if you don't use it. When when did you, like, when did you start? Did, did you always have that mentality, like, yeah. or, or did that happen? Did you just have that realization, I got to turn my life around, I need to start thinking <laughs> longevity and... No, I've always had that. I mean, that's, that was one reason I quit drinking, you know. I mean, I, I, I would. that's what I tell people. I drink like I do everything else. If we're going to open a 12 box sitting right here, we're going to drink it right yeah. here. And if we open a 30-pack, we're going to finish it. And then we <laughs> might go get a bottle of whiskey, and then we might go to town and go to the bar, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was me. That was just like that's that's the way I was raised. I mean, you start something, you finish it. Right. I mean, my mom and dad always told me, clean your plate. You know, I guess it started when I was a little kid because if you start (laughs) eating something, even if you're full, you just like you were made to finish your plate because that was money that they spent to feed you. Mm -hmm. And if it was wasted, you weren't wasting it, you know. And so that's kind of where I I guess I developed that mentality, you know, in football and basketball. I played sports and was a good athlete, you know. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and say I wasn't. And so I was a good athlete. I was all state football player, both sides, offense, defense, special teams. You know, what I mean, I played ever down from my sophomore year to my senior year. I didn't. I was on the field. You know, basketball. I was a all state basketball player. I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't like running, but I did do track because yeah. I grew up in a small town. You know, I pole vaulted. You do everything. I pole vaulted. You know, I mean, if we'd had a baseball team, I'd have played baseball. Yeah. You know, I mean, it didn't matter. And like, kind of tied your identity to <clears throat> being an athlete. Right. That's that's was my realization too. Uh, I started going to the gym like a year ago and started paying a little bit of attention to my body and, and stuff. And I was like, man, I can't do the things that I used to do. And I, I was the same way. Uh, I loved sports when I was a kid and I didn't play past junior high, but that was my choice to, I wanted to rodeo and put it go. into, put it into that. But um, they tried to get me to play everything. And, you know, I was pretty athletic, I guess, but, right. I got old and soft, or, you know, I got 30, you know, yeah. <laughs> late 20s and soft and drinking all the time and eating bad and cleaning cleaning my plate and mm-hmm. just got soft. And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't want to be that. I want to be an athlete still. Right. But to do that, you got to do some, you got to start some habits to, to keep that up. Yeah. To be something different, you got to do something different. Exactly. There's no doubt in my mind, you know, I mean, it's just like me and people, when I started working out, you know, everybody made fun of me. Mm-hmm. All the cowboys that I run around with, oh yeah, Mr. Workout guy, Mr. Where, you know, blah, Mr. Muscles. Well, you were the only one yeah. and still kind of still like in the 1%, you know, that, a ca- a, you know, somebody that's considered a cowboy, but is also has muscles, you know? Right, right. Yeah, you know, it, it was always funny. Like, And it made me a better cowboy as well because mm-hmm. I could go longer, I could go harder, I could ride more Bronx than anybody else, you know? It didn't matter. I'm going to get on five a day if that's what y'all want to do. Mm-hmm. We go tie the yearlings down, you know? I mean, the double muggins were big back then. then and I went to every double mugging, which nobody wants to – I mean, like that's a – that's kind of a young man's sport, yeah. and you can do one or two. Well, hell, I'd enter Stanford and I'd have 10 runs at Stanford, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And go through – that was when it was three head of – before you even got to the short round. So it was like, 
it was a rough. I mean, there was times I left Stanford, Texas as a Texas and it's Cowboy. It's 110 out yes, there. Sir. <laughs> and like I couldn't walk, you know, my hands what's crazy is if you do if you do it and you've probably been there too, your fingers are all cut up because every time you reach the mug one, they open their mouth oh, and belly yeah. and their tongue and their teeth cut your fingers and then mm-hmm. they just get infected. And so over a two or three day period, it looked like I've been in a knife fight, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean their teeth just raking my fingers apart. And I, I remember when we made the short round, Zach Wadsworth and I, one year, and uh, I had two runs back in the short round. And the Saturday before the short round, we were at his house, and he got his kneecap dislocated, kicked off and dislocated. So he didn't go on with me. I had to get another guy to go with me for mine and his run. But the only thing I was needing, I was needing some Neosporin because my fingers and hands were so sore from all the cuts and bite marks of cattle biting, you know, which is crazy. You don't even think about that until you're in that situation. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it was a – Yeah, like, you don't – like Roy Cooper one year at the finals, you know, he had to get stitches in his hand because he run down the rope and – Tooth hooked calf, him. Yeah, that calf yeah. had bellered and – Right as he was going by, and and it and it split his hand up. Yeah, you 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 wouldn't think a cow's tooth to do that, but I mean they're so sharp at that young and that year that stage of their life. Those teeth are sharp; they're like mm-hmm. little razor blades. And if you catch one just right, it is it'll it'll lay you open. Mm-hmm. So you know, even doing stuff like that is just kind of. You know, I mug mug all the cows at the ranch rodeo, and I go to a double mugging. And I'd enter three or four times with different guys, and you know, just whatever. Like, let's go. Like, yeah. we want to do it. Let's do it. Let's get it all on. See who can be the last man standing. Yeah. That's my mentality. You yeah. know, it's kind of fighting, drinking, working, roping, cowboy, cowboy, whatever you want to do. <laughs> let's see who the last man standing. You know, put yeah. your money down, and we'll all gather up and see who's standing there. And it's all said and done. And if you, you know, it's like. It's just like anything now, like the rodeo guys, they're 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 rodeo athletes. Those mm-hmm. guys train and train and lift weights and run. They're rodeo athletes, and that's the only way they can stay competitive. Yeah. Because if you're out there like they did back on in the eighties and nineties, drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and go get on a bull here, go get on a bronc there, I mean they, you ain't gonna you 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 can't even touch those guys. Yeah. Or there's, just, or there's no longevity anyway. Yeah, it's impressive to see the guys that are doing what they're doing today. I mean, mm-hmm. it really is. And they're hellacious athletes, no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. It's fun to watch those guys. Like, I've gotten more back into rodeo because of the mere fact of watching it. Is, it's really fun to watch because those guys are impressive. Like, they train hard and they pay attention. They study film, which is crazy to me, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? There's all kinds of aspects now they can they can get on their phone and watch a bronc that they drew, you know, five different outs somewhere else and know exactly or have a really good idea about what he's going to do yeah. before they ever put their saddle on him. You know, we didn't have that opportunity. You mm-hmm. just ask the stock contractor, what does he do? Most of the time they tell you he bucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, well, what do you measure or your bronc some, some might want to jack with you and yeah. tell you something wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah, they always tell you something <laughs> wrong because they don't want you riding them, especially one of their good ones. So, yeah, I never listened much to those guys. I'd hear the other guys back there, and I kind of figured that out at a young <laughs> age, you know, young in my career where I was like, I'd ask a few of them, and they'd tell me something totally different, you know, and then I'd get my head smashed off in <laughs> – they're like, you know what? I'm just going to go at this some bitch like my own. Like, I think I should go at him. And yeah. It started paying off a little better. Yeah. But. Uh, we kind of got off there, but yeah. you, you, uh, so let's see, you were, uh, you were turning, you turned your life around. You decided, you know, you didn't want to party as much, live in Fort Worth and, you moved to East Texas, right, on yeah. Ireland. Who did you work for over there? So I went to work for a guy named William Lipsy in Oakwood, Texas. And, uh, he run a he had a big yearling outfit. Still does, I guess, today. Mm-hmm. Yearling outfit. I think that year I worked for him and I was there about a year, almost a year and a half, I guess. And we run twenty three thousand head of yearlings through that place. Mm. And he had nine hundred head of cows that we tended to as well. So it's a full time job. Yeah. It's seven days a week. And that was one reason I went down there because I knew it was a workhouse and I just quit drinking about that time and I needed to needed get something to do. Needed to go away from that. And that was one thing that I guess I learned about myself was that I would go out and have a big night drinking or doing or running or weekend or whatever it may be. And then I would come home and to punish myself, I guess, for doing what I knew I shouldn't have been doing, I would work my ass off. Like, I got to work anybody. It didn't matter. Like, mm-hmm. I could have an hour's worth of sleep, and we could work for 15, 18 hours. And, like, it could be 100 or it could be – but I punished myself that way. That's kind of my punishment because I mm-hmm. knew I wasn't supposed to be doing what I was doing, and so I would punish myself with working. Yeah. And so when I quit drinking – you got to change your environment 
to change anything. You got to change something. And so I just moved off because I needed to get away, not because I needed to leave my friends, but I needed to get away from those guys yeah. because they knew change your habits. Exactly. They knew what I was and who I was and what I did and what I could do, you know? And so I moved off to somewhere where nobody knew me, mm -hmm. took that job and I'll never forget it. The first time that we pulled back up to the barn, and then probably a week after I've been there, the guys that were there, we pull up, unsaddle our horses, and like we've been going since four that morning, and it's eight o'clock that night. And we get there, and the guy says, Hey, boss, you want a beer? I said, No, nah, man, I don't drink. I appreciate it. And that was the first time that I actually came out of my mouth and told somebody I don't drink. And they didn't, I don't, I didn't drink. I'd quit drinking. But if I'd have told somebody that knew me, they're like, bullshit, you drink more than anybody. Mm -hmm. But that guy never said a word. He said, oh, okay, no worries, I keep, because he didn't know. Mm -hmm. and so it was so much easier for me to change my habit because then I just got to telling everybody and I got to saying it out loud, I don't drink. Man, yeah. I appreciate it, but I don't drink. And, and you, so, said, you said I don't instead of saying I'm trying to quit. Right. And that's, right. that's a big thing also. You know, you, you that was your identity is I don't. That was it. I don't. You know, I don't drink. And so those guys, they didn't ever bust my chops about it. Whereas back when I come back home for the weekend or something, it's like, hey, you want a beer? You want, Let's go to the bar, man. I don't. I, no, I'm not going. I don't drink anymore. Mm -hmm. And they're like, ah, bullshit, whatever, you know. I mean, it was that. And so it was easier. And it took me about a year and a half to kind of figure out that, I, hey, I can do this deal. And then I moved back and kind of. Went back to just day trashing and riding colts and doing whatever. And so, and Ranger was on the way, right? Yeah, Ranger was on the way. I got married. I come back and got married. And Ranger was on the way, and that was, that was another pivotal, right. pivotal, pivotal time in your life. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So you know, knowing I had a kid coming, and we, I when I came back from East Texas, of course, I brought some yellow dogs with me and a bunch of them because I figured out down there you had to have yellow mm -hmm. dogs to do anything and uh, or to get stuff done like what we were doing mm -hmm. and so i had a big string of yellow dogs and they were good because i worked them every day you know yeah. i mean they went every day just like me and we were they were handy so i got back home and i was day working trashing riding the colts and catching a lot of singles and doubles and stuff like that somebody called me and said hey i got some cows i can't yeah. catch can you come yeah yeah and so i got a call from a guy that i knew and they had a they couldn't catch a bull and i went over to the place that i ran for 16 years after that and caught mm -hmm. this bull for him with my dogs and pinned him and got him loaded and hauled him off and then they saw kind of what i could do and they asked me a few times hey you come back and help us and i said yeah and about the third time i went over there they offered me a job running that ranch and i didn't want it i turned it down three or four mm -hmm. times because i was like man I, i've worked for somebody full time and i don't really want to, i've got a good circle made i'm making a good living for what i am and who i am and I turned it down three times and they just kept coming back to me and asking me, Hey man, we really want you to run this ranch. And so finally I figured out Ranger was coming and I didn't have health insurance, you know, and yeah. I, I, I had a semi steady gig, but I didn't, I mean, I was a day trash guy. I think, I think, uh, that was a big deal for me when, when we found out we were having a kid was like, you start thinking it changes your perspective for sure. I mean, you got to start thinking about the future and somebody else and, and not just, you know, where am I going to work next week or right. this week? You know, I always try to line my day work up, you know. Sometimes it was further out, but a lot of times it was Sunday night. You know, you're calling people and or people are calling you and you're yeah. kind of lining your week out. But you well, got to you got to think a little further ahead when, <laughs> when you got a little one on the way. Yeah, for sure. It changes everything, you know. And uh, so I just kind of wrote down what I wanted. They kept calling me and I was like, all right. Mm -hmm. Y'all really want me? Here's what I want. And I wrote a list of stuff down, and he called me back, and I read it off to him. I said, if I come to work for you, this is what I want. And it was pretty stout, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It was, and he was like, okay. Yeah. I'm like, well, hell, I guess I got a full-time <laughs> job. <laughs> got a job now. And so I moved there. It was, it was one of the best. It was a good, it was a very, very good part of my life, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a cool ranch and met a lot of people and got to do a lot of cool different things and see different pe places and people and like I, I really enjoyed it it was a it was a pivotal moment for me in my life because it did it put me right in the edge of fort worth but i was still cowboy and i could access fort worth and the people and i guess the publicity or yeah. you know the uh, is that when you started getting some recognition yes. like with schaefer and like your model deals and stuff is yeah. that when that came right about then you know i mean it was you know six or eight years after that and like i of course i was able to go to start going to a lot of ranch horse shows and going to a lot of muggins because i was using my horses a lot you mm -hmm. know i mean i was a cow calf deal but i also ran yearlings through the winter dry dry winter some yearlings 
And so I'd always have something around there. In the wintertime, I had yearlings to take care of and doctor. And so, you know, just as well as I do, your horsemanship goes up, your horses get better, your roping skills yeah, go up, you everything it. gets good. And then in the springtime, we'd go to Brandon Caves, and, you know, I mean, it was just a cycle that you get into, and it was good. Like, mm-hmm. I traded and swapped and rode horses and trained horses and went to ranch horse competitions and got to showing in the AQHA and kind of doing that and going to a lot of ranch rodeos. And that's kind of when my recognition started was going to them ranch rodeos and getting that still kind of going. And the double muggings, I mean – all, all that and so got a little bit of publicity and recognition from that and then a guy came to work for me that was ex-military spec ops guy he had retired out of the military that's what i wanted to get into yeah. that was that was another yeah that was uh, another pivotal yeah. moment in my life another life-changing experience mm-hmm. was when bert came to work for me and it that that changed my whole like it changed my whole life more or less i mm-hmm. mean because bert and there's a reason were you no, were you looking for anything nope. then you were just content no i wasn't it's crazy like you say you never know what that one person that you shake their hands gonna do for mm-hmm. you i mean and i don't mean like you know like take advantage of them type way but just shaking somebody's hand and visiting with them and getting to be around them a little bit and change mm-hmm. my perspective on different things you know what i mean because he had a whole different lifestyle upbringing mm-hmm. than what i did and then his whole adult life he spent in the military, you know, and so yeah. and and there's a reason they call it special ops. Those guys are special. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I, I, they're they're special individuals that they train them and their their mentality is to a point where I think we can go back to that one percenter deal. Mm-hmm. I mean, the same thing. Those guys are one percenters. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people in the military, but there's only a handful of those badass spec ops guys. And, yeah, not they're not only like badass physically, but they got to think a lot. Oh, in that. My, their mentality so, is yeah. just unbelievable, and that and that also helped me just trying to learn and watch and see what he does and pick his brain when he was working with me about different things and such. And give you an example about him, like he came to me. He didn't. He grew up on a farm in Kansas and didn't know a whole lot about ranching or horses or anything. But a guy that could do anything. He was mm-hmm. in great shape me- physically, mentally, and he wanted it. Like, yeah. that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to work on a ranch. And those three things right there, if you're in good shape physically, you're in good shape mentally, and you want something, you can go get whatever you want, mm-hmm. and especially in today's world. Because most of the time, like you say, people aren't in shape mentally or physically, and they might want it, but they don't want to put off forth the effort to go yeah. really get it. And those guys will. Like, mm-hmm. And so one day, the way my barn was set up, I had a shed row, and I had seven stalls that when the horses come in the feedlot in the mornings, that I'd open a stall. And, I mean, when I say a stall, I mean like a 10 by 20 wooden stall mm-hmm. that was under a shed row. And so I had cedar posts that held the shed row up on the end, and I had those screw-in rings that, you know, that you just screw in. There. There's a ring yeah, hanging the off of it. An eye ring. Mm-hmm. And that's where I'd hang all my halters. So in front of pretty much every stall, there was a halter hanging there. And it ended up being two or three on each post as it's all said and done. But, you know, just as well as I do, most people don't know how to tie a rope halter. Mm-hmm. And so in the mornings, my horses, I'd whistle my horses in or I'd gather my horses, whatever it took. And they'd come in to feed. They each go in a stall, feed one. I'd catch what horses I want. I'd halter the rest of them. I'd tie them out around my feed pen. And then I'd come in in the noon. I might catch me another one, or I might turn them loose, or I might leave them standing there all day. Mm -hmm. And so in the afternoon, that was our main, that was our last task, was to kick all the horses out and hang all the halters back up, and then we were done. (coughs) Excuse me. And uh, so I was showing Bird how to tie a rope halter, and – Oh, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. And, of course, he went right back to tying it over the top. <laughs> and so I would go back down through there, and I would untie them and just throw them on the ground if they were wrong. i just untie them, throw them on the ground. And he would go back and look at them, you know, and he's like, what? I tied those wrong? I'm like, yep. And so we'd go back over it. And about the third time I went over it, I'm like, come on, man. Like, what the hell? It's not that hard. <laughs> and he was like, show me again. And this tells you what he was mentally. And so I'm – putting a halter up there and showing him how to tie it. And I turn around and look at him and he's got his phone and he's videoing me. Like, hmm. And in my mind, I I still don't understand why he's videoing me, you know? And then that afternoon when we leave, he he said, can I take one of these halters? I said, yeah, you can take whatever, you know? So he took a halter home and he watched that video. And I'll tell you to this day, he will never tie another rope halter (laughs) wrong. But he took it home. I mean, that said something to me that he was – 
He was trying. He was trying that hard, and he wanted to do the correct thing. And so that that said something like that locked it in with me. I'm like that guy right there. And I asked him about it, you know, a month or two later. I'm like, why? And he said, because here's my deal. He said, where I in my world, if I don't know how to do something, somebody might die from it. Yeah. And he said, so that's just the way we train. Is if you can't physically or, or mentally see it and then do it, then you record it and you practice it. Mm-hmm. You know, or you go somewhere where somebody can show you time and time and time and time again. And so that said something for me. But anyways, Bert was one of those guys. And uh, one afternoon, we got done turning horses loose, and he hung the halters up. And I come out of the barn, and we'd always kind of talk right there by my feed truck and say, hey, be here at this time in the morning. This is what we're going to do, yada, yada, yada. And uh, he said, hey, I got a, I got an idea, and he said, I want you to help me with And I was like, what's that? And he said, I'm going to start a company. I'm like, a company? Like, I ain't never, <laughs> oh, yeah, what you going to do? Yeah. And uh, he kind of told me the premise of the idea and what he thought, and he was like, I want all the information and help that you'll give me, and if you want to be a part of it, I'd love to have you, you know. And so we started out with one T-shirt, mm-hmm. and we called it Peacemaker Trading at that time. And uh, we made one T-shirt. And he he had it printed. We had it done. Like he taught. He had a big social media following. I didn't even have. So I had Facebook, but I didn't yeah. have any other kind of social media. And he kept telling me, "You need to get Instagram. You need to get Instagram." This is eight years ago, I guess now, maybe nine years ago. He, I'm like, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't, why would I? Would, I don't even like. I don't even look at Facebook much less. Why would I? Yeah. Well, man, you you like this better? It's just pictures or videos, and you know, blah blah blah. And so we got a, he, of course, opened an Instagram page for Peacemaker Trading and a Facebook page, and he did all that stuff. And mm-hmm. he was like, every time I post a picture of you or something on the ranch, everybody wants to know what it is. What, are, what is that? What is, you know, and he's like, it draws a big following. And he's like, you ought to do it because I think it would benefit you in the long run. Yeah. And I kept putting him off, kept putting him, I don't need that. I don't need that. And literally one day we were going to fix a fence and we was in a feed truck and he said, you get, you put Instagram on your phone yet? I said, no, I don't, no, I didn't. And so I just handed him my phone. I said, do it. I don't know how to do it. Do it. And so he put Instagram on my phone and made my account, did everything, handed it back to me and kind of showed me that afternoon how to work it. And man, man, it, 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 that changed my life. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, just that move right there. How, how did that start out? Like did, did it just blow up overnight? Were you just posting no. some random stuff, or was it a long, drawn-out deal? Or? It wasn't that long, drawn-out, because Bird had a social media following already, a pretty mm-hmm. good one, and so he started tagging me and started, you know, we started kind of piggybacking off of he. I piggyback off of him, you know, and so mm-hmm. he would put me in a post and say, hey, go follow Buster Frierson at, at Buster Frierson, you know, whatever it is, and, and he – he started kind of, he helped me a lot because yeah. I didn't know what to post, you know, yeah. I didn't know. And he was like, man, this and that. And then it got to be where it was just my everyday life, real stuff. You know, we were mm-hmm. posting pictures of punching cows and roping stuff and doing this and doing that, welding, building fence, whatever it may be. And it kind of got to rolling and starting gaining a little follower and some traction. And that's when I guess Schaefer came in across the road from the ranch yeah. and I drove by there one day and I'm like, I think I had a Schaefer coat one time and uh, I'm like, I know I did. And so I dig around in one of my pickups and sure enough, I had a Schaefer coat, an old one, like the old canvas brush yeah. jacket that they had that you couldn't wear out in 20 years. <laughs> and so I stopped in there one day just to see what they had. And I thought it was a store, but it was their warehouse and they had a little storefront up yeah. and they hadn't got it set up yet. And I just walk in like I'm buster, you know, mm-hmm. like walk in the door and I'm like, Hey, how's it? And they're like, Oh, we're not open. I'm like, oh, sorry. And the guy's like, well, we'll be opening a couple. You know, he kind of started the conversation. Yeah. I was like, cool, no big deal. I said, I drive by here all the time. I run that ranch across the interstate over there. And I said, so I'm by here all the time. And he was like, oh, yeah. And so we kind of got talking. Well, then they got to following me and kind of seeing what was going on. And we made friends over that little conversation right there. And then they came to me one time. I was just stopped in there visiting with them because i i like the people that run it yeah rick and lynn and nick they're great people and love them they're my family now you know love them to death and so i just stop in there and visit with them here and time to time see how they were doing they were like hey you want to do some stuff with us like yeah sure what do you want to do well that's and so that's kind of how that's when it really started because they started poking it you know to their people and then mm-hmm. burnt and we started bison union was rocking and rolling you know turned into what it is today as a coffee company and a 
you know, more or less a Americana apparel company. Yeah. And uh, so all that put together, it kind of just went whoosh, all of a sudden. And it's like, hey, there's something to this other than just putting a picture up to show what, yeah. you, what you got going on. You could treat it like a job. Exactly. Kind of. Did that, like when that started taking off, did that change your income a lot? Did that almost replace your ranch income or not yet? Or You know, it didn't replace it, but it was sure helping, you know, mm-hmm. whatever, $50 here, or $100 here that I didn't have to spend or that I made off of, you know, if they gave me a jacket, well, that's $200 that I didn't have mm-hmm. to spend for a jacket, you know, and then that led into other, you know, other people like, hey, hat companies, you mm-hmm. know, and boot companies and just like different things that I were using that they were seeing in those pictures and videos and postings. Like a company would see it and they would hit me up like, hey, would you want to do this with us? Or we got this. Would you like to do something? And then I got to turn it into a job. Like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, I'll do it, you know. And it's not on your skill level, like how good you can rope, how you get paid. It's on how many people you have following you yeah. is what you get paid. And so once I figured out like, hey, this ain't just this ain't just for showing people what I'm doing. Like I can make some money off of this yeah. deal as well. And then I really started kind of leaning into it because I knew back in my mind that sooner or later I'm going to be on my own. Mm-hmm. And hopefully I've got enough income that's going to sustain me and my family, you know. And so I was like, I'm going to put this together and that together. And then I got to kind of thinking outside the box. And I think you talk about that a lot too, is just thinking outside the box about yeah. how a cowboy can make money, whether it be buying thin cows or buying heifers and calving them out or buying four-way cutter bulls that nobody wants to jack with in the heat of the summer. I mean, there's always something there that you mm-hmm. can twist if you want to put yourself in that situation and make it work. Well, there's people like influencers like you know um, just creating a following without even selling something. You know, you can monetize that. You right. can – there's, you know, the big influencers on YouTube are getting paid – you know, three thousand dollars a month. That's what a cowboy gets paid. Right. You know, two thousand, two or three thousand a month. They're getting paid that just to post videos exactly. about what they do or whatever. You know, so yeah, that it's uh, that's what I wanted to do here was kind of merge kind of the mainstream, the business world, and, and and show cowboy guys and that you know you need to be thinking about the future. You need to, you know, if you start doing something a little extra on the side or completely change careers or whatever. You know, there's a whole nother world out there because it's we're very, very divided. You <laughs> yeah, know, for sure. Which is a good thing. I mean, we love the Western world, and that's that's why I'm doing it so I can yeah. have more freedom to do. You know, to rope and day work there is, it is. is what yeah. I want to do. But if you go build a little something extra on the side, you know, you could be the uh, the ranch owner instead of you know ranch employee. Bingo. So. And it and it's hard for us cowboys because of the mere fact of. That you know when you step outside your realm or your box, whatever you want to call it, when you step away from those guys that are doing something that you've always it's like me drinking. Those guys are like, Hey, what are you doing that for? That's goofy. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. You know, you get you get ridiculed. Yeah. And it, it's sad to say that, but you do. I mean, I, I was boy, howdy, like there for a minute, <laughs> I was like, everybody's buddy, and then all of a sudden when I kind of started getting a little little notoriety and everybody started seeing me on a cover of a magazine or you know on a tv commercial or something like that it's like oh that's little bitch yeah you well know. you haven't made it till you have haters yeah right? <laughs> and then you get all the haters and then it, and then once you get a little dose of that hater deal you try to like man i don't i don't like that hating deal i don't like them people making fun of me and so you go to and i did it i mean i'm not gonna sit back and i kind of drew back out of it and was like man i don't i don't know i wasn't far enough in it to really get into it and then mm-hmm. i kind of drew back out and was like i don't know if i want to do this or not and then it's like you know what the hell with all them guys yeah they're going to be in the same spot that they're in right now 10 years from now mm-hmm. they're going to still be mad at somebody that's doing better than them and i figured out you know what i mean like nobody nobody wants you to do better than them they want you to do good yeah but they don't want you to do better than them yeah, you never get hate from somebody above you. No doubt. No doubt. All you do is get praise and like, hey, man, I'll help you do, pat you on the back. What do you need? Like, I can help you get here. Or I can, you know, I can introduce you to somebody or I can show you a way to do that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? In the cowboy world, like, I I don't know everything. Like, I like going with different guys in different places and seeing different things because I want somebody to say, hey, this is how I do this here. I'm like, damn, that's a good idea. I wish I'd have known that 10 mm-hmm. years ago, you know. I've been doing it wrong. I've been doing it my way, which took another – x amount of time or it took an x amount of dollars and i can do it this way yeah and it's a better way so 
it's one of those deals where you got to get mentally strong too. I mean, like it's same kind of type deals like going to the gym. You just got to like put your head down and barrel through it and go on, you know, and suffer a little bit and go on. But it's it now it's funny like it goes from one spot where everybody likes you, you know, and you're buddies with everybody, and then all of a sudden there's a bunch of those guys that you're buddies with that don't like you anymore because you're doing better than them. And then it kind of flips back over where they're like, hey, man, I want to do that too. Like, yeah. well, where were you the last three years? you just been making fun of me. <laughs> yeah. You know? It's like, oh, yeah, you're making fun of me. Now you want me to help you? Yeah. And so it's kind of one of those deals where it's like, okay. I, I think that's – that the positivity outweighs the negativity. For sure. I love when uh, – you know, I just post what I'm doing, like, in the gyms. I go to the gym basically every day. Uh, I miss it every once in a while, but I'll post every once in a while. I don't post every day, but, like, somebody reaching out to me, message me, hey, like, I want to get into that. Like, what are you doing? Uh, what are you using? And, and, like, that makes me feel good, you know, that I'm, I'm sending some positivity out, you know, or, or, like, talk about business or talk about this or that or whatever, and, Somebody reaching out and wanting to, you know, they're wanting to better themselves. Like, what what podcasts are you listen to? What books are you reading? No doubt. And uh, I think that, you know, that makes me feel, you know, good. It, make, it, it feels worthwhile. Mm-hmm. Like, what you're doing is actually worthwhile. And there's, I get messages, DMs, whatever you want to call them, you know, on Instagram and Facebook. And like, man, I needed to hear that today or I needed to see that today. I appreciate what you do. Keep up the good work. I mean, I got a couple of them last week. And it's just like, from from bigger companies that I had no context what they even were, you know I mean? Mm-hmm. And they sent me a message and was like, dude, we, we really like what you do. Keep it up, you know, keep it going. And it's like, when you see that and you read it and it's like, okay, all those. And you never know who's watching. Exactly. You never know. And so that makes you feel like, okay, this is worthwhile. All the ridicule and all the ribbon I'm taking and all the people making fun of me, which might be a, just a handful of them. But you focus on that. Yeah. And then you look over here and there's 50 or 60 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 that are like, hey, man, keep it up, keep it up. So it mm-hmm. makes it damn sure worthwhile. And you, and I heard this story uh, on on a podcast you were on about somebody messaged you, a kid wanted to start posting his cowboy content on Instagram, you know, because he, he saw you and thought you were cool. But, I, like that makes me feel really good. Like when a kid, I've got messages, you know, from buddies. I, I wear khakis most of the time yeah. to the rodeos and working and stuff. And they're like, I got to go buy my kid some khakis now because he wants, yeah, because he wants to go get some khakis and tuck his pants in his boots. And I, that, I'm like, hell yeah, that's, that's cool. cool. You know, it's and you really don't, even, I don't even think about it. I just do it because I like it. And then, you know, somebody outside the arena, you know, is watching you and, and yeah. thinks thinks it's cool. No doubt. I mean, it, it, it you know, it's like that black gilded. I, well, it started with my ball face gilded mm-hmm. D-Mac when I was riding a war bridle, you know. Nobody rode a war bridle at a ranch rodeo yeah. or any kind of activity whatsoever. Yeah. You know, horseman activity, horsemanship deal. And I started riding that horse in a war bridle at the rodeos. And, oh, my goodness, like I caught a lot of hate from a lot of people, <laughs> but a lot of love from a lot of people because nobody had ever seen it, you know. Yeah. And then it's like you develop this kind of this identity, D-Mac and Buster and the war bridle. And, you know, and then people, st- what's funny is like, I could ride the horse in a ranch rodeo in a war bridle and win top horse. And they said, well, the only reason he won top horse, cause he didn't have a head stall on. <laughs> like, yeah, that's it. You bet. Well, that, that helps, right? That's part of yeah. it is standing out. Right. If you, if you are riding a really good horse or you are a really good hand and you just hang back in the back and, and right. don't get out there and draw attention to yourself, then you're never going to win that award or, or stand out you know in, in any aspect you got to put yourself out there and that's a whole a whole nother deal i've i've wanted to do that all my life is i've always tried to wear something different or do right. something different you know i like getting some attention you know i, wore, I wear like a grizzly hat or right. like you wear a farmer hat sometimes yeah i used to wear those and tuck my pants yeah. and wear khakis all that you got but you got to do something to break apart from the crowd. No doubt. Otherwise, you're just like a, just like a herd of sheep. Everybody mm-hmm. looks the same, does the same, talks the same. I mean, there ain't no fun in that. Mm-hmm. Hell, that, I don't I don't want to be a part of that. Well, you know, uh, like Waylon, our friend Waylon, yeah. you know, he's got it mastered. He's <laughs> Any rodeo he goes to, he's going to be talking the loudest. Oh, sure. Walking around. He's going to be seen the most, and he wins a lot of those awards. Dang and, him right. And but, he deserves the majority yeah, of them, you but know. but he gets that. He puts himself out there. That's right. And you got to put yourself out there. But when he gets bucked off, he gets bucked off just like everybody else, or he misses just like everybody else, mm-hmm. you know, and he takes that just as well as he takes the accolades. He takes the ribbon because everybody does it. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, and it's hard not to, you know, especially guys that are really are the winners. I mean, when he's winning, he's winning. When you're winning, you're winning. When I'm winning, I'm winning, you know. I mean, it's like one of them deals where I've – I've told some guys, you know, that want to run their face. I'm like, put ten thousand down. We'll go play. Yeah, like let's go. Y'all think I'm just a model? <laughs> like, dude, I've taken more of your money than most anybody in the ranch world. Double mugging, like anything. Like yeah. I've taken a lot of your money. <laughs> like I don't think you've ever taken any of mine. But if you want to talk shit, then put your money where your mouth is and let's yeah. go ride a bronc. Let's go mug a six hundred pound steer. Let's go team rope both ends. Rope some calves. Whatever you want to do, I'm yeah. down. You know, let's go tie a bull down. Yeah. And so it's like. Put your money where your mouth is, and everybody it shuts them up, you know. Yeah, that was it. That was a deal. Uh, like in, I, I, I told you this too to your face. Whenever it was like 2014, I think was the AFCC finals, and we won it that year with Cash and Chris and McCauley, and uh, y'all dominated. You were like you and Waylon and I don't Cody Carter, maybe yeah. I don't remember who y'all went with then, but uh, y'all were like the team going. And y'all had some hiccups or something, and we had a good rodeo and beat y'all. And I yeah. was like, "Hell yeah, we beat we beat Buster and Waylon." And I was like, "We finally got you, Buster." Yeah, exactly. And, and we shook hands, but that was a that was a cool deal. Not only, I mean, we won the rodeo, but that was a big deal to beat y'all. Then. Heck yeah, you know. And I, and I had my guys too the same way. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, like hell, when not me growing up, I wanted to beat these guys because they were always winning. You know, mm-hmm. I wanted to be one of those guys. And so, you know, it's it's cool. It's one of them deals where and. You are a lot more than most people. Like, you would actually, hell, yeah, we beat you this time. How about that? We <laughs> yeah. took your money. And yeah. I, I, man, I appreciate that. I'm like, hell, yeah, you did. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. And, uh, that's cool. You know, I, I appreciate somebody that's fourth front and, like, will sure enough say it out to my face. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what what do you have going on now? You got range hand, right? Are you still with Bison Union? Or? Yep, still with Bison Union. We got, of course, our coffee shops, and my partner lives up there in Sheridan, and uh, coffee shops up there. We roast all the coffee out of the shop up there, and we send it online. We don't have any retail stores. You still doing it's all the uh, the shirts and the, the apparel yep, and all that? Yep, still got all the apparel and coming out with new designs and new T-shirts and hoodies and whatnot, you know, we got all kinds of different things, but yeah, bisonunion.com if you want to check us out. And uh, the coffee's really good. Like I say, we roasted all up there in Sheridan. Bert, my partner and manager, they they take care of all that stuff. And I kind of on the backside where they send me a proof here and there, like, mm-hmm. hey, what do you think about this? And I'm like, yeah, y'all do it. You know, whatever. Yeah. Y'all are doing a great job. Um, I started kind of my own little clothing line, Range Handers. It actually started as a horsemanship, stockmanship clinic called it Range Hand Trading Company. Mm-hmm. And I started kind of putting on some clinics, just individual clinics. If you want to come hang out and ride horses and go get the cows and want to learn kind of some ins and outs of the cowboy tricks and trade that we do, you know, on a daily basis on how to – whether it be if you and, and I'm not selling my services to guys like you because you already do it. You don't yeah. need me to tell you how to tie a yearling down outside. There's a lot of people out there that want to know that information that aren't around guys like you and I, mm-hmm. and they they don't have any access to the information on how to do it. And so I started a couple of people that hit me up about, hey, would, could I come ride with you? Could you treat teach me this or teach me or show me this? And I'm like, yeah. And so in that, I started like, you know what? I ought to put on like a clinic, a two day clinic or three day clinic, whatever somebody wants to do. And I do it, you know, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever your schedule is. If you want to come Monday, Tuesday, you know, I mean, like, I'll work with you if I got stuff going on. Then, of course, I'll tell you that. But yeah, I think especially now with Yellowstone and all that, (laughs) I mean, the cowboy deal is blowing up and being right here by the city, everybody kind of wants to get out in the country and ride a horse. And And so that's been good, you know. I mean, I've kind of been doing that. And that's where Range Hand kind of started was that. And then I was like, ah, you know what? I had some pretty cool ideas on some shirts and some t shirts and some branding and some logos and stuff like that. And so Mm -hmm. me being associated with, Bison Union, the people that do all of our apparel and do all our screen printing and T-shirts and caps and all that, I was already associated with them. So I called them and kind of got in with them. And I do the designs or give them my ideals, and then they actually put it in a put it on a product, and yeah. they take care of everything, you know, from their their side of it. And then that that kind of has turned into just just a, a little apparel and i'm only got like four or five different things right now i'm actually working on some other ideals and kind of going to get some, are you selling meat too not me no anymore? no i had a i had a meat company and sold out of it and got out of it and it just that's a that's a hard 
Mm. Well, a bunch there. of them popped yeah. up. I mean, it's a great idea. It's just it got watered down. It did. You know, you got to. I think you can't just start it anymore. You got to yep. put a lot, a lot of effort a into lot, marketing and stuff now. A lot of effort because there is, like I say, a lot of people selling. You know, ranch, ranch to home, ranch to plate, whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it. To uh, the box beef industry is it's, it's blown up, and it was kind of one of those deals where if I'd have, if it would have taken off whenever we started it, me and two other guys, it kind of took off and then it kind of stalled out mm-hmm. we had some issues and had some problems and whatnot and then just hiccups that go with starting a business you know you got to figure out which way you're going and kind of set an end goal and we didn't do that because we didn't know that at that time and yeah. we just thought oh hell you can just box some beef up and send it to somebody yeah you know? shit it's easy but it ain't that easy yeah but so i sold out of that just because i didn't have enough time to jack with it i was like i'm done with it and those guys took it a different route but uh that that's that's no longer but i've kind of oh i guess got it i'm i don't even know got into the movie deal yeah you know i mean that's kind of been a big thing the last few years with me was yeah i just saw you on bass reeves we finally watched that the other day (laughs) yeah that's been a crazy whirlwind ride too you know i mean i kind of got in on a few little deals just like going and wrangling for the movies with another buddy of mine, that guy that I met and he was already in, he was already in on it. And so he called me a couple of times and I went and did that. And then I ended up working on 1883, one of Taylor Sheridan's mm-hmm. movies, shows, TV series, um, trained all the cows for that show, the, all the drive cows for that. That was kind of what I was tasked with was to get in there. They bought the cows, the production bought the cattle and then they threw a, 25 longhorns together 25 corianis together and like 20 yearling heifers mm-hmm. herfords together and of course they were all from different places and some a lot of the longhorns were bought out of the cell barn and so they were pretty wild and get them bro you had to get them broke. i got them broke to drive and handle on the set <laughs> and we did that which that in turn i got in of course the stunt people started seeing things and they were like hey could you could you do this or can you do that or would you do this and so i started that and i got into the stunts and and then Taylor put me in the cast just because once we turned the cattle loose with the actors that had no experience yeah. driving cows, <laughs> they didn't know how to tend to them, you know, or handle them. And so it was kind of a wreck right there. And Taylor was like, hey, can you drive those cows from right here to over there to mm-hmm. the camera? And I'm like, yeah. And so he put me in costume, put me on cast, and I was in the show the whole time. You don't see me but a few little times here and there. You'll see in the side of my there. face or I'm in the background, you know. But that kind of turned into – the stunt guys seeing me and then different guys seeing different things on those movie productions. And they're like, Hey, you know, the next one started, they're like, Hey, can you come up and do stunts for us? And so on 1923, I worked stunts on it the whole time and got shot off my horse and figured out, trying to figure out all that stuff out, you know, and getting, getting in with those guys has been really cool because stunt guys are like cowboys Mm -hmm. and a lot of them are the cowboys you know especially in these western shows and so you get to see two or three different sides of the stunt industry you know which is pretty cool and i ain't even touched i mean barely tipped my toe in it yeah but it's been fun and a lot of the guys that i worked with i love them to death they're like brothers like you can go punch cows with them and then go to the movie set i mean it's been a cool deal so then i got in on bass reeves and the stunt crew and then i got cast in it as an outlaw and we rob a stagecoach and get mm-hmm. shot and, you know, that kind of stuff. And You I never know where those opportunities lead to. No, you never lead know. To. I you mean, know. that's what I tell people all the time, like, especially people like that, you know, quit their, their ranch job or quit a full-time job. It's like, just say yes to everything after that. Right. I'll go anywhere. I mean, like, I have some parameters, like what I want to get paid if I'm going to go day work, but... I'll go somewhere for less if it's somewhere new. I'm going to work around new people, see something new. You know, you never know. You might meet somebody there that will change your life. No doubt. No doubt. In in all walks of life, you know. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's funny how you say that. I say the same very thing. It's like don't ever – Take it, take 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 advantage of every opportunity to mm-hmm. meet somebody, shake their hand, and then because it might they be might ba- change their life. They might yeah. change your life. It, it might really be might. a bad deal, and well, what did you lose one day? Yeah. You know, yeah. or whatever. Maybe you learn something from mm-hmm. it. You know, I mean, take the good and the bad. I always get I get that question a lot from younger guys, cowboys. Like, what's what's some advice you would give a young up and coming cowboy? Go to everywhere you can go, work everything you can do with anybody you can do it with. 
take the good and the bad and learn from them. Mm-hmm. Don't do the bad again. You, I mean, you got to go experience it before you know it's bad. Yeah. And so, like, there's places you go learn the good, and then you there's places you go that, man, this sucks. I'm never coming back here. Yeah. But you learn something like, hey, I'm not doing it that way. Like, yeah. there's ways to do it better, you know, and not knocking anybody's ways, but there is. There's mm-hmm. ways to do it better. And there's people that don't understand that. They've never been in, outside their little ranch and their great grandpa did it this way, and we're still doing it this way. And sometimes it's a great way to do it, but sometimes it's like, man, that's bullshit. Like, mm-hmm. there's a way better way to do that for both man and beast. Yeah. So it's like, take every advantage you can of going anywhere you can go. And like, I don't know, a few years ago, hell, I traveled all over. You know, mm-hmm. somebody said, hey, come help me. I went and worked for them. Like, yeah. I, I just went, I went to Arizona, I went to Colorado, I went to Montana, I went to Wyoming, you know, I mean, like I went everywhere I could go, and sometimes I went on my own dime just so I could see different country and be around different things. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have that luxury, go do it. Yeah, I mean, don't turn it down. Go do it. I mean, it's, it might suck, but it might be the best thing you ever did too. Yeah, and if you look at it from the perspective, like I started looking at it different. You know, you're trying. I mean, you're trying to make a living, but also, you know, some people would pay to go experience For that. Sure. You know, if you're if you can go to West Texas and and see how beautiful that country is, right. that big country, and gather cows and drag calves, that's a great time. Or, you know, like you've been to, you know, up north and all that and see all that pretty country in the mountains and everything. A lot of people pay to go yeah, do that kind of sure. stuff, and you're getting paid to do it. Exactly. So. Yeah, it's a it's a cool deal. Take advantage of every opportunity that lays down in front of you. And, you know, you never every, know what it'll turn into. You never know. Or anybody that you meet, you know, you never know who's man, that you're shaking somebody's hand or telling somebody hi, what it might turn out, you know, what might turn out of it. So I got a few just wrap-up questions um, just out of my curiosity, what what would you say are like some non negotiables that you would you have like daily? Like, is it you're exercising every day, you're eating something every day, you're reading, or like what would that be for you? <laughs> well, I would say non negotiable about working out, but I haven't been very good about that here lately. <laughs> just the fact of I'm getting older and freaking beat up. Yeah, and, you know, this last year was a freaking red well you may not have any i yeah. mean some people no, don't but. Uh, my non-negotiables are i am my non-negotiable if you tell me and if i tell you to be at my house and you're not there at a certain time then that's kind of my non-negotiables and today i showed up late over here on your deal. <laughs> <laughs> so i don't have my ass shout for yeah. that but uh <laughs> That's kind of one of my non-negotiables. I mean, like showing up on time, doing, showing up doing on time, and, and doing it until it's done. Mm-hmm. I mean, like do it till it's done, no matter what. And as like this morning, I got up and we had to weld a little old piece of in the wind blowing, and I'm like, and I'm just I, that's what my plan was today, and it sucked. I could have turned around; it was for myself. Yeah, I could have turned around and went back to the house, but I'm like, no, I'm doing it today, like it's going to yeah. be done. And we did it. I mean, like we got it done. This sucked the whole yeah. time. It sucked because we were riding the wind and it's cold as hell. I think that's a that's a good one. I yeah. mean, integrity. That's a an easy one. It's you don't have to have any talent, any skills. Just do what you're going to say. Yeah, no doubt. Um, what about, are you a reader at all? Yeah, you, I've been reading a lot more. And I tell you one thing that I've done in technology. I've got Audible. Mm-hmm. I listen to a yeah. lot of Audible books because I am in the pickups. You know, quite yeah. a bit more than I am anywhere. Like. And it's just Bluetooth to your truck mm-hmm. nowadays, and it comes on, and it goes to talking, whether it be a podcast or whether it be history. I like reading a lot of the history, like old cowboy history, any kind of history. I don't know. I'm, I guess the older you get, the more you want to know about oh, yeah. the past. I love history. And so the history and the Audible, and, and I did just get a book the other day. I ordered it online. It's called Modern Warrior. And mm-hmm. I started reading it. It's a pretty cool book. It's just kind of a self help book. I read. I started reading a lot more self help. Listening to a lot more self help stuff. What do you think are like? I think it's hard to nail down one of anything. Like, what are like maybe top three or something? Like audibles or the yeah, books or just, or just books. Yeah, Modern Warriors has been a. From what I've started, I really like it. It's pretty simple. It's pretty basic. It's a. Uh, it's a. It's a good book. Just about self improvement mm-hmm. and about what to do. You know, in certain situations about like mentality, you know, I mean, having the right mentality about getting up in the mornings and doing Jocko. I like listening to Jocko. Of course, yeah. he is hardcore. You know, um, I listen to Joe Rogan a little bit, but not much. I, I, I mean, I, I just, I'm a fan of Joe Rogan. I just don't listen to his podcast. Yeah. Uh, I tell you. <laughs> what about like a cowboy book? Cowboy book? Yeah. I started reading uh, Cowboy, a uh, Pecos Cowboy. 
Carol Jack Lewis gave me that the other day when I was out there helping him. And if Carol Jack, if you in the cowboy world, you know who Carol Jack is. Mm-hmm. He grew up on the bell. He was a wagon boss at the bell for a long time. Poodle cowboy. Like, and a good guy. Like this guy's a cowboy. And he handed me last time I went out there and helped him, which was about two or three months ago. I went and spent a couple of weeks and we wean calves and worked some cows and whatnot. And he he runs McCoy Remy ranches out in mm-hmm. between Fort Davis and Balmeray. Really cool country. And if you know there's any mountains in Texas, you will find out really, really <laughs> soon that there is if you go that way. But uh, Pecos Cowboy, which is a history book about the Pecos River. And when the cow drives were going across, the uh, there's only five crossings in the state of Texas that you at that time you could get across the Pecos River. Mm-hmm. And so it made a lot of – killed a lot of cattle, killed a lot of cowboys and horses. And, like, it, it, it's a cool book. So that was one of them. A Pecos Cowboy is what it's called. Okay. What about like a? Have you read any business books or you got anything like that since you yeah, got, no, since you started really, your journey? No, I haven't really. I've I've read the little red book on sales. Have yeah. you read it? Uh-huh. So it's a pretty good book. It just kind of teaches you what salesmen need to learn. And in in this world, we're selling every yeah. day. You're selling yourself. You're selling your product. You're selling your skill. You're selling your ideals. You're selling your voice. You're sell, I mean, you're selling something. Yeah. Every day, Bradley it's, says you're you're selling something. You're, you've been selling yourself short for years. Exactly, no <laughs> doubt. You know, I mean, even something like that. So that was kind of one of the business books I read was the little red book on sales, mm-hmm. and it's a good book. It just kind of tells you how people how to how to negotiate and kind of how to barter, communicate, communicate, and, and kind of ha- how to always have the upper hand when mm-hmm. you're doing trading. And as cowboys, we trade all the yeah. time. <laughs> Whether you're trading money or trading horses or trading blood, I mean, we're trading something. Yeah. What about like what do you watch? You watch much TV or movies nah, or TV I don't watch shows? A whole lot of movies. Um, I watch. <laughs> I watch the news. I guess yeah. I'm that old man now. And that <laughs> hey, I, I watch, do that too. Every I watch morning. the news. You know, in the mornings when I'm drinking my coffee and having breakfast, mm-hmm. or I guess uh, <laughs> online. I, on at night when I lay down in bed, I, I watch Netflix and find some show on there. And then again, I go to. I don't really go to that. Just like non-existent. Just a show. Like I want to watch a history show. I want to watch a documentary. To on, get something out on of it. something. You know, I want to watch like spy ops on Netflix. Mm-hmm. I just finished that. You know, it talks about the different things like Secret Service and all the spy agencies do. I just watched uh, the terrorist show on stuff that they stop before it happened. You know, it yeah. just goes into the, like documentaries and like that kind of type stuff. Um, last one. What about you got any regrets? I know you've you know you've been to jail. You've had a hard <laughs> life and turned it around and done this and that. You got you got anything you'd regret or? Nah, you know I mean, what I did growing up and who I am is what you know because of what I did. Mm-hmm. And I think I don't regret any of it. I wish I wouldn't have done some of it. But yeah. then I look back at it and it's like, man, if I wouldn't have done that, then I wouldn't be who I am today. Yeah, exactly. And so maybe that helped me. You know, maybe me spending. 45 days in jail, maybe that helped me, you know, figure out who I am and what I am. And I know it helped me with my drinking, you know. I mean, yeah. that's that's when I got down and dirty and told myself I was <laughs> better than that. I shouldn't be there. My parents raised me better. I was a better human being. I knew better than that. I was better educated than that. And so that's kind of what made me quit drinking and decide that, hey, I am, I am the only one that is liable for what I am mm-hmm. and who I am. Nobody else. I take all responsibility for everything I do. And that's kind of one thing that I think a lot of the world today, nobody wants to be accountable for their actions. You know, you look at the news, you watch those people, like nobody wants to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And that's one big thing, I guess, non-negotiable deal. I'm accountable. Hey, man, if I mess up, I'm just going to come to you and say, hey, I messed up. I'm not going to lie about it. I'm not going to try to cover it up. I'm just going to tell you I messed up. Mm -hmm. This is what I did. I shouldn't have done that. This is what happened. You know, whatever we need to do to fix it, we'll fix it. And so being accountable in today's world is something very big on on my my mind all the time. And that's how I raised my boy was like, hey, man, you can go do whatever you want. Because I did whatever I wanted for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I was accountable for all my actions. Like if I did something and I got in trouble for it, hey, I did it, you know. I mean, that's that's my bad. I shouldn't have been there. shouldn't have done that. shouldn't have drank that. shouldn't have said that, whatever it may be. And so I guess... That non-negotiable deal, too, you get back to that. We asked me earlier, but accountability is big, big for me. Yeah. I, I can I can deal with a lot of stuff if you're accountable. And so I guess 
if you want to end it on that, accountability in today's world is few and far between, and you're a one percenter if you hold yourself accountable. Yeah, and that that's what you said too is integrity. I mean, yeah. that goes right along with it is doing what you're gonna what you said you're gonna do. Yeah, so. for sure. Well, I appreciate you coming in, uh, being episode one of the Wealthy Cowboy. And uh, I'm sorry, I probably just taint your podcast <laughs> after they see this one. And nobody's like, don't ever watch that again. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you coming in, and uh, we'll see you again. Yes, sir. No, thank you for having me. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Hope we can do it again. We'll talk about something else five years down the road. Yeah, we'll have part two. On the Wealthy Cowboy part two, (laughs) for sure. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you, Crockett.